thank you, State Rep. Carl Sherman, for joining us today on another episode of our Dallas Unplugged podcast. The Dallas Unplugged Dallas Area Habitat podcast really allows us to talk to folks who are serving in our community, um, not just around affordable housing, but talking about some of those issues that have to do with affordable housing. So thank you, State Rep. Carl Sherman. Thank you, Jolie Robinson. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on your podcast and uh, share with you uh, the way that I view things. And uh, perhaps uh, there are some things that we can do better and I can walk away uh, from this conversation. I anticipate better than I came. Oh, I appreciate that. I really do. Um, so, so everyone, if you're out there, you've probably seen a, a podcast or two. My name is Jolie Angel Robinson. I serve in the VP of Government Affairs and Public Policy role for Dallas Area Habitat. Um, we're talking, I'm going to give a brief, uh, a few sentences to give an introduction for our state rep Sherman today. Um, everybody knows I have notes. So if you see me looking down, I am not shy about looking down at my notes. I don't want to forget anything. Um, state rep Carl O. Sherman Sr. was elected in November 2018 to the Texas House of Representatives presently uh, representing District 109, which covers a vast area. So I'm gonna get you to talk about that as well. Parts of Dallas, Lancaster, DeSoto, Cedar Hill, Glen Heights, Ovilla, Siegelville, Wilmer, Hutchins, very busy guy, I'm sure. And other areas of Southern Dallas County, Representative Sherman has a long history of community and civic engagement. He serves as a senior pastor, was the first African-American mayor of DeSoto in 2010 and was then reelected as mayor in 2013. He has been on the forefront of many pivotal decisions and actions and in a variety of board capacities. And I'm just absolutely thankful that you're able to join us today. I'm gonna jump right into Q and A because I think you just have a fascinating history, Rep Sherman, um, of civic engagement and community engagement but also want to talk about the 87th legislative session just ended. Can you talk a little bit about uh, your policy priorities in this latest legislative session and even as your time um, in your mayor position? Yeah, so uh, which would you like me to start at? Do you, you want me to start about the session or uh, mayor? The session is perfect. You can start for this latest session, um, your policy okay. priorities for this latest session. Okay, so Joey, this is my second session uh, that I've had, and uh, I've requested uh, the same as I requested uh, at my first session, committee assignments, and I was uh, blessed to, to receive exactly what I asked for, uh, which was uh, appropriations, and that was a big deal to have a freshman appointed to appropriations, and uh, it's considered even a bigger deal that I'm still on appropriations. Uh, and uh, certainly that was important to me because uh, you have a seat at the table on uh, the committee uh, that makes the recommendation for the budget. And there is only one thing legally, constitutionally, that we are required to do each session, and that is to pass, to pass a budget. So $250 billion, uh, you are uh, at the table uh, to have some influence. Second uh, committee that I requested then and I requested now and I have again is to be on the committee uh, that is over our Texas Department of Correctional System, uh, TDC. And on corrections, there are nine members and I think it's important to be on that committee, especially when so many people of color are incarcerated in our system, whether it be incarcerated in the prison system of uh, the 98 prisons that we have. When I first came to office, uh, we had 101, 102 prisons. It's been my focus that we would close prisons, including private prisons, and we've closed three. Uh, and we've gone from 145,000 uh, souls incarcerated to uh, now about 120,000. Uh, and most of the people that we have incarcerated, uh, half of them at least, are incarcerated because of marijuana. And so there are some changes that I believe we need to make 
uh, in our laws and uh, in our penal system as well. Uh, most of our prisons don't have air conditioning in the housing units. So people are literally dying in our prisons when temperatures rise uh, to 130, 140 degrees in the housing units. And there's a lot of work that we can do there. Uh, I'm also on subcommittee one, four, and five, uh, which is a subcommittee of appropriations, which was important to me. Last session, I was on higher education, uh, which was a committee, subcommittee that was appointed to me. Uh, I didn't necessarily choose it, uh, but I wanted it. And God gives us the desires of our hearts. Uh, and I'm grateful for that being the only uh, North American or North Texan uh, representative uh, well, I say uh, not North Texas, Dallas County representative that has a four-year state university in his district, and that is UNT Dallas. Dr. Mong and the folks over there are doing an incredible job with one of the lowest student tuition in the nation, and when we have student loan debt at now to the tune of $1.6 trillion, we've got a problem, and most of that is held uh, among African-American women, uh, almost a trillion of that is held by them and that affects their quality of life, it means uh, that it's a longer time before they can uh, buy their dream home and participate uh, in those things that they've worked so hard to get an education for. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm appreciative of them, they get it, they understand uh, what my priorities are and making sure that uh, college degree shouldn't cost uh, a life and limb uh, for them. But in getting on one, four and five, it's important to me because what I see in our criminal justice system uh, should be, uh, it's been that way since the beginning, uh, since uh, police officers were created in our nation. And I'm not saying that police officers are bad. My youngest son is a police officer, and I believe that police officers, by and large, are good. But there are, uh, this is not about a bad apple. This is about a problem, a culture issue in our uh, policing and law enforcement. And so after George Floyd, uh, the killing of George Floyd, I thought it was important that I be assigned to the committee that is over all public safety, that is over all of the agencies in the state of Texas. So I would have a seat at the table uh, of a five member committee uh, to have more influence on, on what goes on in our criminal justice system. As I look at what my aim has been uh, for this session, I've got to tell you uh, my DNA is uh, economic development, how we can improve economic development and create more equality uh, and uh, have less disparity uh, between uh, people of color and non-people of color. And there's so much uh, that is tainted in our policies uh, that help shape the outcomes. And so uh, that's important to me. It takes time uh, to really unwrap and uh, you know, eliminate these things from our system because it's a foundational issue. And when you have a culture now that is pushing back uh, with uh, these, uh, uh, they say cancel culture uh, or cancer culture, uh, uh, these are issues that say to me and to people of color, that they don't want to hear anymore. Uh, they believe that everything is fair and equal when the reality is it is not. Uh, it is not. There are no white George Floyds in America. There are no white Botham Johns in America. There are no white Brianna Taylors in America. There are no white Tatiana Jeffersons in America. There are no white Jordan Edwards in America. And the list goes on long. Over a thousand people are killed by police in America. That's three every day in 
other industrialized nations, whether it be Canada, uh, whether it be the UK, Germany, or France, if they have three in a year, they're protesting in the streets. We have three a day in this country, over a thousand every year by firearms, over 50 by stun guns. We've got a problem and we need to realize that we've got to eradicate the Confederate spirit in this nation that seems to still be here. Now, you know, I usually uh, say, or I said this the first time on the House floor, and, uh, you know, I'm really grateful, Jolie, that uh, I seem to be able to uh, hold uh, my fellow, uh, you know, members' attention. Uh, but I am very sincere when I talk about these issues of these inequalities, these uh, inequities that we face in this nation. I I've said this before, but I'll say it again, Jolie. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe uh, that if uh, Stonewall Jackson, a Confederate hero, general of the South were resurrected today, I believe if he took a tour of this state and this nation, he would be proud to see the over 1,300 monuments and statues of Confederate contemporaries of his and, and of himself. I believe he would be proud if he drove down the streets in any city in America and saw the names of his contemporaries and himself being honored with these street names. I believe that if he walked and saw all the parks named in these Confederate heroes' names or these buildings, these other institutions and schools that are named after them and military bases that are named after him and others that fought against this nation in perhaps one of the greatest insurrections of this nation to split the Union that Stonewall Jackson, who died May 10th, 1863, two years before the Civil War ended, I believe he would be confused to some degree, but he would be proud. And I believe he would believe that the South must have won. Conversely, Jolie, I believe that if the great emancipator President Abraham Lincoln were resurrected. Lincoln, who saw the end of the war, who knew that the North won, I believe if he took a tour of this nation and this state, saw all of those monuments and compared it to the 31 monuments in his honor, statues in his honor, and not all 31 of those are in the United States. I believe President Lincoln would be convinced, though he saw the war end and saw the North won, that there must have been a second war and that the South must have prevailed. So my work is plenty to try and eradicate this systemic racism that's in our system, that's in our policies, that's in our culture, because we are facing a generation of legislators who don't even know our complete history. And so when they introduce uh, voter suppressive bills like SB7, many of them don't even know the history. And so when they roll out and lay out their bill, they use terms like uh, purity at the ballot not even knowing the genesis of that statement. I believe that many of them don't know because they're not told our history because they want to whitewash the history. In fact, uh, there was legislation that was passed to do that very thing because they only want to tell people what they want them to know and not how uh, this nation has disregarded people of color and the indigenous people of this nation. I want to say this real quickly. You know, there is a time in each and every one of our lives where 
We've been told that we look like our mother or we look like our father or perhaps your grandfather or grandmother. And you don't see it. You just don't see it. But one day you look in the mirror and you realize, that's my grandfather I'm looking at. I can see it now. I may not be as uh, tall in stature. I may not be as demonstrative or my voice may not be as intimidating and commanding, but I look just like my grandfather. I said this to the house floor members. You're looking in the mirror and you don't see Jim Crow, but you ought to see James Crow Esquire. You're not as rude and crude. You're polished, but it's the same thing. If we don't recognize our past, as Mark Twain says, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And this is the problem, the cadence that this nation and this state has. That's how we can have these bold or racist legislation and think nothing of it. That is all about bringing integrity to voting. No, it's about changing the outcome. It's about ensuring that you can control power because the electorate is changing demographically. It's changing and we have to be willing to change, but it's gonna take your group, your listeners to be engaged and say, we're not going to go back. We cannot go back. We owe it to our parents. We owe it to our, uh, uh, our, our forefathers to never go back where they've been. And so uh, this session has been focused on economic development. It's been focused uh, on uh, criminal justice reform. You know, I've worked hard as an appropriator to get uh, body cams in our prison system uh, where people are raped and killed uh, in our prisons. Uh, and you know, as the first, as you mentioned, first African American mayor of the city of DeSoto, our city was the first city uh, to have body cams for all of our police officers in the nation, 2011 2012 fiscal year. I didn't make it a political thing. I met with our city manager at the time. I understand budgets and I proposed to him make it happen. We didn't make it a political thing where it went before the city council, it was just an executive decision that we made. And what we found, I would get calls from African-American mothers and grandmothers telling me how their sons were treated, their grandsons were treated by our police. And, uh, you know, those calls uh, dissipated because, you know, those body cams served as a behavior modification tool. And uh, sometimes, sometimes though, People would call and say, I've got a complaint about your police officer. And then I'd say, well, let's go down to the police station and watch the video. We've got body cams. And they'd say, well, never mind. That's okay. Uh, so it works both ways to help our police. And, and so I put in a rider for 25 million to get body cams for all 20,000 correctional officers in our prison system, the way legislation works. I'm just a sophomore, a lowly sophomore, uh, though I'm an appropriator. Uh, last session, I did the same thing. I only went to 2 million. Uh, and this session, I went for the whole thing. Uh, it goes over to the Senate in conference and there are five senators, five uh, you know, House of Representatives who uh, negotiate on those funds. You know, the good news is once it's appropriated, it's there. Uh, bad news is the Senate can uh, reallocate where those funds go. And so uh, we went down, unfortunately, to 1.5 million, but that should afford uh, us to be able to get 600 body cams uh, where we can start. I'd like to uh, start making sure we go into the uh, prisons that have the most offenses 
uh, that have drug trafficking coming in because it's not coming in through the prisons. Uh, and uh, so these body cams would go uh, to one male prison and one female uh, prison unit is, is my uh, plan. I tour our prisons. It's important to me uh, ever since, uh, you know, I, I saw where President Nelson Mandela said that you should not judge a nation by how it treats its highest citizens, but how it treats its lowest citizens. And you will not know the heart of a nation until you go into its prisons and its jails. And how we treat people in there is really the heart of this nation. And folks, we've got a lot of repenting to do. And so uh, that, that's one of the things that, that we've gotten done and, and so many other uh, things. I have been talking so much. So I want to stop to make sure uh, that I'm going in the right direction, uh, Jolie. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. I've, I've jotted down notes because, I mean, you've okay. talked about things um, that I, I know I didn't put it in the question, but this is kind of how conversations come up. You talk about how policies help shape outcomes. So for criminal justice, for economic development, for the housing space that I advocate for, you talked about policies help shape outcomes. You talked about equity, which always makes me think of, you know, the quote I tell people all the time, equity has to be baked in. And it's a quote I heard, equity has to be baked in and not sprinkled on for it to truly make mm -hmm. a difference and for it to truly matter. Um, and then you, you talked about, you know, eradicating systemic racism, knowing our complete history, even in the housing space, understanding redlining, understanding um, what gentrification really is from a historical standpoint, understanding, you know, black and brown folks historically being locked out of opportunities for bank loans in certain communities and neighborhoods. So really you, you pulled out a lot of awesome, awesome things. And so really when helping folks out there understand those different policies that help shape outcomes, it's not enough just to put in the budget that things need to happen or cameras need to be you know, given to all officers. There have to be policies written around that. So I know as your time, you talked a little bit about at your, as your time as mayor, the, um, the body cam, but also a little, can you lean into the economic development maybe as your time as mayor as well in the city of DeSoto? Yeah, you know, when I became mayor, uh, it was an interesting time. My uh, meeting with my first, uh, my first meeting with my city manager, Jim Ball, at the time, uh, he presented to me, I'll never forget this, uh, a tablet of notes that he had made in, in our budget. And he said to me, the first thing we sit down uh, for a lunch meeting, and he says, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the financial report that I'm about to show you, sir, is the worst that I've ever seen. And almost 40 years that I've been a city manager. We have lost over a quarter of a billion dollars in assessed tax value. Now for a bedroom community, that's a huge impact. And he had a list of names of employees that he said to me, who do you want to lay off? Uh, my response to him was, we would not lay off anyone. We're gonna change the way we do economic development and we're going to change the way we do operation. Now, I was young, and uh, as a younger man, I started a uh, business and since I was five years old. Uh, my father was a businessman, and I always looked up to him. And uh, my wife and I, Michelle, uh, we started a company, took it public, uh, and traded on the NASDAQ in the U.S. Uh, and the Frankfurt Exchange in Europe. And so uh, I had experience uh, dealing with business and shareholders and understanding that sometimes you just have to change your business model some in order to become more efficient. Uh, the easiest way to reduce your overhead is to cut uh, staff, to uh, cut personnel. Uh, but that's really not sustainable uh, because if you're demand is the same, uh, you're not going to be able to keep that up for long. And that's just a short term, easy way uh, to fix a, a issue that may not be temporary. And so uh, that's what we did. Uh, and we started being intentional 
about going after certain economic development projects. Uh, I was not a fan uh, and still am not a fan of uh, distribution centers. And I understand that uh, business models are changing in retail and, and they have changed dramatically. Uh, most uh, orders are online uh, when you look at sales and retail. And so I looked at companies uh, that were looking at coming to North Texas. And one of those companies uh, was um, Kohl's. Uh, Kohl's that was headquartered out of Wisconsin. So it's headquartered out of Wisconsin. And they were looking at coming here. They had uh, three site locations they had selected. Justin out by uh, Alliance Airport, which made sense. The Ross Burroughs groups out there. Uh, Carrollton, I believe. And I want to say uh, North Dallas somewhere, uh, maybe Richardson, really, and that they had chosen. And uh, Carrollton, I believe they had a facility already ready for them. That was a little over, just a little over 800,000 square feet. They needed 900,000 square feet at least. Uh, and Carrollton was uh, buying for them, hoping that, you know, since they already had the facility built, uh, that would be the choice for them. I worked with Commissioner Price and asked him uh, to lean in to see if he could get them to come to DeSoto as well. And they came to DeSoto. Uh, it was late in the evening. Uh, by this time, I have a new city manager, uh, Dr. Teron Richardson, and he and I uh, built a close relationship. Uh, he was the first African-American city manager for the city of DeSoto. And uh, we're riding over to the site location in which I've asked our economic development corporation at the time to uh, mow, mow that area, to grade that property. Uh, not just to mow it, cut down the trees, and they graded the property as though something was coming, right? We had no deal. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, Teron, Dr. Richardson, looks over at me, and he says, all right, coach, you're the point guard. Uh, and, you know, he didn't know at the time that I didn't know much about basketball. Uh, but he played basketball in high school and college and could have went on to the pros if it had not been for an injury. <laughs> and so, so uh, you know, I just take that uh, reference. I took it as uh, he's saying that, that I'm taking charge. And it's funny, though, Jolie, because uh, at that time, a lot of people would mistake me for uh, Derek Fisher, uh, who played basketball. <laughs> and, and, you know, people have no idea when they see this guy on television, they think he's short. Because among these six, seven, seven foot players, he looks short, though he's six, three or something like that. So anyway, I'm not at all six, three or six foot anything. So uh, we get out of the car, uh, the bus, they have this charter bus that drives onto the property there uh, off of Eagle Park and the Eagle Park uh, uh, development there in DeSoto off 35. Uh, and... I simply took a, you know, I took an invitational close from a pastoral kind of thing, and I mixed it in with uh, Elijah Gray, a story about Elijah Gray, who, uh, who invented the telephone, but he was a little later than Alexander Graham Bell. He filed his, or he went to go file his patent later. Alexander Graham Bell had gotten it. I don't even remember the details of it. Uh, but but that was my close. These guys were so excited. Their number three guy for Coles, the executive uh, team, was there. And they got back on the bus. We had everything for them, a tent out there and everything. They got back on the bus. And about a week, two weeks later, we get the call that they're coming to DeSoto. Uh, they, they're coming to DeSoto if we can make it work. And I started meeting with Commissioner Price and uh, he was willing to get the county to do some things on incentives. We did some things on incentives. We got our Economic Development Corporation to do some things on incentives. I signed an opportunity zone agreement. 
uh, to incorporate us with the Inman port there in Hutchins and Wilmer uh, so that they could get some advantages there. Uh, and uh, that's how the deal worked. Now, the funny thing is, Jolie, uh, about a month later, their number two guy, the CFO, comes to Dallas County Commissioner's Court and he's there. And at the time when I was mayor, I would always go to Dallas County Commissioner's Court. That's when they met weekly. And I always came and I remember uh, the, uh, what's her name? Uh, you know, there's a barbecue place uh, that her husband owns. Uh, I forget the name of the barbecue place, but anyway, it's, it's a franchise. Uh, uh, it kills me when I can't remember things sometimes. But uh, she said, Mayor, you're the only mayor out of the over, I want to say she said approximately 30 mayors we have in Dallas County. Right. You're the only one that comes here every week. Why do you do it? And, and my answer was because, you know, cities are downstream from counties. And I want to know what's coming downstream and I, I think it's important, uh, you know, that I, as the mayor of our citizens, uh, have a representative, uh, my lights go off when there's no motion, uh, have their representative here at the table. So their CFO, upon being introduced to me at this meeting, this is the first time I'm meeting the CFO of Coles, he says to me, <laughs> he repeats my clothes. <laughs> that I did to them about Elijah Gray and everything. Uh, so words are powerful, uh, but certainly actions uh, have to back up uh, those words. You got to do your homework. And, and that's, it was so important to get that deal. And why was that? Well, let me tell you real quickly. Fulfillment centers are different than distribution centers. Fulfillment centers pay their employees a little more about 20% more than distribution center employees. Distribution centers for the city, you only realize the property tax or ad valorem tax, and then jobs, but jobs that don't pay as much as fulfillment centers. Fulfillment centers, you realize property tax and sales tax. And looking at their revenue, because they are a publicly traded company, you can look at their 10K, right? And you can see that they produce enough revenue if a distribution center is in DeSoto, that the revenue just from, because all you're going to get is the sales tax revenue for the state of Texas, it's incredible. It is the equivalent of putting 300 football fields or 300 uh, retail stores of Coles under one roof. So that's how DeSoto surpassed Cedar Hill in sales tax revenue by that one fulfillment center. Uh, and, you know, Katie bar the door, if you could get an Amazon like Dallas got, game over, you know. Uh, and so that's, you know, you, you've got to watch the trends and see how you can establish your city to have a foothold in the future. Now, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, legislators, this last session, this session we just came out of, uh, tried to kill deals like that. And what I mean by that is that, you know, the author of a bill uh, out of the representative in a more affluent area north of us decided he would file a bill that would now change how we realize the sales tax. So it would not be the originating city where that fulfillment center is in that realizes the sales tax revenue, but it would go to the distribution address. So as you order online, there is a you know, person in a fulfillment center that's putting it in a box and sending it to you, to your home, not like with a distribution center business model where uh, as Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, uh, developed this system where uh, a distribution center is within 300 miles of all the retail outlets. So those trucks drive to the stores. Well, this is going to you to your door. Well, what happened last year that was so devastating 
to retail store outlets were, was COVID. Retail stores, many of them were closed. And even if they were open, people weren't going out there. They shopped online for their groceries. They shopped online uh, for their food. And so everything changed. And that meant that those cities north of us lost a lot of sales tax revenue because it's all coming in through Amazon and it's all coming in through Kohl's and, and these different uh, fulfillment centers. That changed everything. And so now they want to change the game. They want to change policy so that they can change outcome, which will cripple the cities in the southern sector that have won those deals. Uh, and what happens is, and I'm a former city manager, I can tell you that in many of the cities, not DeSoto, but where I've been a city manager, like in Ellis County or in Hutchins, uh, we didn't have a ladder truck. Uh, that's a fire truck with a ladder. Well, fulfillment centers or distribution centers, their fires start in the, in the ceiling. It starts in the roof. Doesn't start down here. So you need a ladder truck to extend over to be able to extinguish those fires. If you don't, they can't come. They can't afford the liability. And so that means the municipality has to incur a cost. On average, the minimum cost is about $1.5 million for you to get that fire truck. So now that city has the debt service for that and these Northern cities don't care. The game has changed. Well, they should have been studying the trends in the first place to understand that it was changing. And they did. They tried to get these uh, companies, but they also had the arrogance of, well, we got these big retail centers. We got these big malls. Well, life is changing. And if we are going to stay ahead, we got to make sure that we've got a seat at the table and understand the games that are played and trying to change policy. Because once policy is changed, the blueprint and the outcome changes, right? Uh, so I'm going I'm to just pull it back a notch and dial it down some and let you, Jolie, be the calm one in the room. <laughs> no, no. I mean, all of this is powerful. Even you explaining that, um, you know, I have participation on a chamber of commerce. And when we saw that come across, we were trying to, on the board, we were trying to digest and understand, well, what does this mean for the tax revenue? What, what does this mean for the end user, right? The, the shopper, is this, is this gonna just be passed along? Like we were trying to understand. So the way you just totally described it was helpful. I'm also in Leadership Southwest. And so we took a, we took a tour of the Inland Port, right? And the fulfillment centers and seeing all that is happening. And it, I mean, absolutely impressive, the work over the years. I, I graduated from Duncanville High School in 2000. I've lived in Dallas. Uh, we first moved to Redbird area when I was in sixth grade. So just to see what you're speaking about, to see the transition even of Redbird Mall, to see uh, the, the Inland Port come about, to see those conversations happen. Um, even taking a physically taking a tour, not just of the fulfillment centers in the area um, of Wilmer, Hutchins, and DeSoto in that area, but also physically the inland port and how that operates was incredible. Um, and, and really, in my opinion, a game changer for the great Southwest region. Um, and, and so to, to me, when I'm trying to correlate my, my previous role at DPD, not only public safety, but investments in city, but also in the housing space with Dallas area habitat, people have to be housed, right? If you're if you're if you are trying to get C-suite folks to come in a fulfillment center, and so they don't have to keep commuting to somewhere far north, an hour or two on a toll um, to get all the way down, housing has to be a part of those conversations in Wilmer, Hutchins, DeSoto, Lancaster so on and so forth. So I'm sure as your time as mayor looking, you know, as you said, looking to the future of what that looks like of economic development, of public safety, of housing, of tax, like all of those things play a role in what you're able to do for your city, for your constituents and for businesses. Absolutely. It is all holistic for a sustainable community. You know, uh, when I'll share with you a funny story, uh, Senator, I mean, not Senator, uh, Commissioner Price, uh, I really uh, 
appreciate his intellect. Uh, you know, he is uh, perhaps the smartest elected official we had uh, in North Texas and perhaps even Texas. Uh, there are some really brilliant elected officials we have, but he understands uh, the uh, he understands the economics of this and budgeting uh, more than anyone I I think. And one of the things that uh, we uh, both understand is the importance of transportation and housing, you know, affordable housing too, uh, and that variety. So you can uh, also uh, accommodate those that are in the C-suite, as you mentioned. Uh, but uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm being told that I, I'm uh, pressed on time, but, Understood. but let, yeah. me tell you, uh, let me tell you, uh, in Hutchins, when I was city manager there, before I came to be city manager there, Commissioner Price, uh, which you know I, I consult with, along with uh, uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson and Senator West, uh, and, and others. I mean, uh, countless others, especially business people. But uh, uh, Hutchins didn't have any transportation, any mass transportation, and uh, that's a problem. Uh, it's a challenge, uh, and none of the cities in the Best Southwest did. And so I developed a uh, unique business model uh, that uh, I shared with the commissioner, and then I invited uh, Dart, the CEO, and the chairman of the board uh, to my office in Hutchins, as well as I invited Star Transit, uh, the CEO, and the CFO to my meeting. And I presented to them separately. First, the meeting was with DART. I presented, I'm sorry, with STAR. And I presented the business model to them. And it was simply this. Uh, the the uh, companies in that inland port and the southern sector have a challenge with workforce mobility. It's a huge issue. And uh, with that problem, okay, okay. Uh, with that problem, that means people can't get to their jobs and they may not even be making enough to fix the problem quickly. And so you have people not showing up to work and having a hard time attracting people. And uh, so I presented to FedEx and to Amazon.com and to other corporations there in that area, Hutchins, uh, I said, what if, uh, you know, we provided transit authority for you and you had a contract with us as a municipality? As a municipality, not you, private sector can't get this discount, but we can, a 10.4% discount if we have an agreement with a transit authority. That's a federal requirement that we get, we'll pass on that savings to you. So they'll invoice us, you, they will give us net 30, you pay us upon receipt, and you'll save hundreds of thousands of dollars because at the point, amazon.com was paying $20,000 a month just to have people go a few miles from the Walgreens there on uh, Ledbetter and Lancaster Road, there's a Walgreens just north of the dark light rail station. Those, those uh, 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 van pools can't go to the transit authority. Regulations won't allow them to. They can only go near it, around it somewhere. So that meant that somebody who's riding the light rail has to go out in the elevator, go over to Walgreens, get in the van, and then ride over there. And that's about $20,000 a month that they pay for that. We saved them tremendously. FedEx was paying like $8,500 to us. Uh, other companies were paying a little. And even Jack Matthews, who, you know, uh, Jack, you know, Matthew Jack Southwest. Matthews. Yep. Right. Uh, I asked him to participate because he built an affordable housing uh, development in Hutchins 
And I said, look, you got to have transportation there. Even though the van, the not the van, but the bus was passing there, I said, hey, the stop, it's $2,500. <laughs> so we got a red line and a blue line that tied into both light rail at dark, went to Cedar Hill, uh, went to DeSoto. One of the stops was Cracker Barrel because I like Cracker Barrel. And <laughs> to the hospital there in Lancaster. Yeah, these, uh, and I've had citizens tell me in the grocery store at Walmart, and I'm sitting in a meeting one day because, you know, I had just finished being mayor because I, I was mayor and city manager at the same time my last year as mayor. And uh, I'm sitting there and the mayor, the new mayor of DeSoto, my friend, uh, the uh, late Mayor McCowan, uh, comes into this meeting. I'm sitting there and she says to everyone in the meeting, does anyone know where these dark transit buses are coming from? They're coming through DeSoto. They're stopping at Walmart. They're stopping at the Cracker Barrel. They're stopping. And uh, she, she didn't know, uh, but it provided a service even for DeSoto residents and Lancaster residents and, and Duncanville and, and uh, Cedar Hill and Dallas. Uh, and even my oldest brother has been riding it and he doesn't know, I've never told him uh, that, uh, you know, he's talking about, it only costs a dollar. Well, I negotiated for Hutchins that they're senior citizens, I'm the youngest in my family, but their senior citizens uh, would be able to ride free. Oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the kind of collaboration and partnership I think we have to have. And we need thought leaders who are willing uh, to invest uh, time to be innovative and creative. And you can't do that uh, unless, in my opinion, you invite everybody to the table. Because at the end of the day, Jolie, none of us is as smart as all of us. There's not a single one of us that if you put one of us up against all of us, that they would be smarter. If we're truly listening and everyone is heard, because we can, we can create better and do more. And as cities, we've got to learn to work together in collaboration to ensure that we create a sustainable and prosperous future uh, for our children. Uh, we've got so much more to do. I want, I enjoy uh, talking uh, with you today. Yeah. And you. I hope that we can have another opportunity uh, to really unwrap uh, uh, unpack a lot more uh, things that I think we can do from higher education uh, to sports, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, to policy making uh, in this area in healthcare, uh, because we have to understand that though the odds are stacked against us, as John H. Johnson uh, once said and was. Uh, the founder of Ebony and Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. He said the advantage of the disadvantage. Mm. There are a lot of things that we can capitalize on, even discrimination, if we understand how to really unpack this thing, redlining that's done. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've got to stop doing things that are sabotaging our future. You know, so many of our people of color move away from us mm -hmm. we move into these areas and we mm -hmm. think it's a prideful thing to say i'm the only one in this community well not only are you the only one in the community but you're the only one that paid the premium that you paid because you're going to pay a higher cost just because Absolutely. you are of a different complex uh, complexion uh, than others to buy into that community and your children are going to pay a higher cost now, I'm not promoting segregation, but I'm certainly not promoting that we ought to be chasing anybody, but we ought to be building our communities and wherever God plants you, enhance that area, grow it. And you know, uh, if land value goes down uh, just because we're the majority, then capitalize on it and let's yeah. build up and let's build a better area. And I'm, you know, I, uh, I just uh, think we can do more. Uh, with less. Well, thank you so much. You have been fantastic. I really want to continue conversation with you. So um, I look forward to that. Thank you for your time. I know it is extremely valuable and for all that you're doing to serve our city and, uh, and everyone 
um, here in all of the cities that you serve and represent. So thank you so much, Rep. Well, thank you, Joey. Thank you for all the work you do. And thanks for helping to get the word out about the opportunities we have to make things better. I'm looking forward to the next time. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see what we can do to expand the territory that God has given us. Amen. Have a good one. You too.